Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Child Maltreatment Investigations, the Role of the Children's Advocacy Center, with Taylor May, who is the Supervisor of Prevention and Community Education at the Cooper Anthony Mercy Child Advocacy Center in Hot Springs. My name is Anna Kate Bogards, and I'll be your webinar moderator for today. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know a little bit about the RBEST program and do some quick housekeeping announcements. So Arkansas Building Effective Services for Trauma, or RBEST, is a state-funded program at the UAMS Psychiatric Research Institute. And our aim is to improve mental health services for children and families who have experienced trauma. We work closely with multiple partners to build a more trauma-informed state, and we're probably best known for providing training to mental health professionals on treatments that are effective with helping children and families recover from trauma. So that's a little bit about our best. Um, many of you have heard this that spiel many times, <laughs> but in case you haven't, that's who we are. Um, and just some quick housekeeping announcements. Um, so you are encouraged to ask questions throughout the presentation. The way that you do that is there's a question box or feature on the right side of your screen. You can just type in your question and um, we will reserve some time at the end to try to get to as many of those questions that we can. So feel free to do that at any time. And um, <clears throat> a quick note about um, audio and video. This presentation includes uh, one short video at the end of the presentation. If you're joining by, if you're joining audio to this webinar with your phone, you may not be able to hear the audio from the video when we're running it. Sometimes we have that problem, um, but otherwise you should be able to hear the rest of the presentation and it's just a, a short video uh, about ch Children's Advocacy Center, so you won't miss too much. Uh, but just to let you know, in case that you don't hear anything for a few minutes, that's what's going on. If you're interested in earning a CEU, just be sure to stick around to the very end and I'll give you some more instructions on how to obtain that. Um, we are recording this webinar, which we upload to the Arbest YouTube channel. We also have some previously recorded webinars up there, so feel free to check those out. Also, um, don't forget to check us out on Facebook, our best, UAMS, our best. Um, and we frequently put up there training opportunities, upcoming webinars and resources. So that's a, a great place to get some of those uh, resources. All right, well, I'm going to turn this over to Taylor and let her introduce herself. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so excited to be with you today. My name is Taylor and I work at the Cooper Anthony Mercy Child Advocacy Center in Hot Springs. We do have two other locations, one in Mina as well as a Benton location. I have been here for about five years. Um, different roles I've been in are um, Supervisor of Prevention and Community Education, my current role, the Lead Child Advocate and an Education Advocate. Prior to my time here at the Advocacy Center, I was an investigator with the Arkansas State Police Crimes Against Children Division. Um, during my time there, I covered 14 counties in the state, and I've also worked at the Criminal Justice Institute, as well as Second Chance Youth Ranch doing case management for foster children. So today, I'm really excited to talk about child maltreatment investigations and the role of children's advocacy centers, as well as some prevention tips at the end. As most of you know, you're probably aware that April is Child Abuse um, Awareness and Prevention Month. So let's get started. I am an instructor through the Arkansas Department of Education for continuing education credit, as well as the PDR for child care facilities. Um, and quests for law enforcement officials. If you find this training beneficial, please share it with your friends 
and reach out to me for additional trainings. We're going to start out by um, discussing the definition of child maltreatment. And this is the definition through the Child Maltreatment Act. So when you think about calling the child abuse hotline. So child maltreatment means abuse, neglect, or abandonment of a child by a caretaker. A caretaker can be a parent, a guardian, a custodian, or a foster parent. The caretaker can be anyone ages 14 years of age or above that's entrusted with the care of the child. So this could be a sibling even. Child maltreatment occurs when the caretaker harms the child, lets harm come to the child, or fails to meet the child's basic needs. Child maltreatment law also includes sexual abuse and exploitation. And this form of maltreatment can be um, by anybody. It doesn't have to be a caretaker. Some signs of um, maltreatment, these are more like red flags as professionals, things that we should be aware of um, if we see any of these signs. So unexplained injuries. You know, oftentimes if a child, especially a young child gets an injury, they want to tell you all about it. But if a child comes, comes in and they have injuries and the explanation doesn't make sense or they are hesitant to give an explanation, the child or the caretaker, that could be a red flag changes in behavior. Oftentimes, if we have a good relationship, good rapport with the, the child and the family, we know when something's going on, their behavior changes, and that would be a red flag. Fear of going home. Um, you think of the children at school that all day they seem fine, and then at the end of the day, they're scared. They come to you and they say, I don't wanna go home. You know, something's going on at home, please don't send me home. Changes in eating and sleeping habits, changes in school performance and attendance. Maybe they're gone for days at a time with no explanation. Um, lacking personal care or hygiene, risk taking behaviors, and then inappropriate sexual behaviors. So if a child has knowledge um, that is not normal at their age, you would want to pause and ask the question, what's going on? Have they been exposed to something? Um, so these are just a few red flags, but as professionals, just to be aware of. So I'm sure most of you on the um, training today, you are a mandated reporter. And so just wanted to briefly cover the law. So mandated reporters, um, any individual listed as a mandated reporter shall notify the child abuse hotline immediately. And here's, um, you only have to have reasonable cause to suspect that a child has been subjected to child maltreatment or died as a result, or you observe a child being subjected to conditions or circumstances that could result in child maltreatment. So this means you don't have to have a disclosure from a child. You have to have reasonable cause to suspect. And at the beginning um, where it says immediately notify, that means immediately. We don't have to wait and collect um, weeks worth of notes before we decide to call. The hotline can accept numerous um, allegation types. In fact, there are at least over 50 types that can be accepted. So you may have a child come in for a counseling uh, session and they tell you a little bit. Well, you know that you're gonna have a session next week. So you decide to wait. Go ahead and make the call with your first concern, say it's today. And then next week, if the child um, discloses even more, call that in as well. It's not wasted time. Those allegation types can be screened together in the previous report. Um, so you don't have to wait, call immediately. Also, as a mandated reporter, you are protected because you are reporting in good faith. You're protected from criminal and civil liabilities. However, there can be penalties for failing to report. Um, you could lose your profession, professional licensure or um, you may get fined with a misdemeanor.
So how do you make a child abuse report to the hotline? There are two ways. You can call 1-844-SAVE-A-CHILD or you can fax in a report. And there's the website there for the fax reports. However, as a mandated reporter, if you choose the fax form, you cannot remain anonymous. And this is only to be used for non-emergent situations. So an example would be, a child discloses to you in session today that something happened five years ago in another state and they're no longer around that alleged offender. That could be faxed in. There's no um, immediate threat. I always recommend calling the hotline because you're going to have that conversation. And when you call the hotline, everything is audio recorded. So if you get to the end of a call and the hotline operator says, this report is not accepted and you feel very strongly about it, you can always ask to speak to um, a supervisor who may be more seasoned and that can ask you some additional questions and listen to um, what you've already told the operator. The fax forms are typically processed throughout the evening and the night hours. So it could be a while before you get a reply from um, fax and a report in. And when you call the hotline, they will ask you for identifying information. You can, even though you're a mandated reporter, you can choose to remain anonymous. But I will tell you, um, as a previous investigator, I always wanted to have that follow-up conversation with the reporter in case I needed to ask additional questions and we could have that um, conversation. So highly recommend um, that you call 1-844-SAVE-A-CHILD. I briefly want to cover what happens when you call the hotline and how the assignments are sent out for investigations. So you will call the child abuse hotline and they will ask you a series of questions, right? Um, at the end, they'll tell you, yes, this is accepted. This will be assigned to the um, Department of Human Services, Division of Children and Family Services, or this is accepted and will go to the Arkansas State Police Crimes Against Children Division. Both of these agencies work together through the Child Maltreatment Act. However, they have very different goals. Um, Arkansas State Police Crimes Against Children, they're primarily working severe maltreatment cases. They're working right alongside local law enforcement. Um, usually their cases um, will result in some type of criminal um, proceeding. So you think about prosecution or an arrest being made or a warrant being issued. However, you have DCFS, um, their goal is reunification. They really want to work with the family as um, a unit to get them services and keep the family together. And to take it um, a step farther. So there are two priority types when you call the hotline. And you'll see this also if you fax a report in, they'll say it's accepted, it meets criteria, it's going to be either a priority one or a priority two. So priority one cases have a 24 hour response time. So if you call today and they say, yes, it's a priority one, they may come to your facility within 24 hours, they may go to the child's home or best practice, they will refer the child to the advocacy center. And then there are priority two cases that have a 72 hour response time. And a response means laying eyes on the victim child and having them interviewed and ascertaining their safety. But what do you do if you call the hotline and they tell you this is not accepted, this doesn't meet criteria? And you may think, well, why not? Remember the definition at the beginning, it has to be a caretaker unless it's sexual abuse, that can be by anyone, any age. So if you feel very strongly, um, go ahead and do a report to local law enforcement. And remember to always call local law enforcement if a child is in imminent danger. So if you know that the child is leaving uh, your counseling session and the offender is the one coming to pick them up, you wanna call law enforcement immediately so they can respond on scene. And just a little information about child maltreatment investigations. 
they typically have about 45 days by law to work their investigation. Of course, depending on the situation and different circumstances, they can extend their investigation and get an extension um, approved by their supervisor. But just bear in mind, it does take some time. Now, local law enforcement, they do not have a time frame. They have to have lots more information to make an arrest or issue a warrant. Whereas um, state police and DCFS, all they have to have to find their investigation true is a preponderance of evidence. So what does that mean? Think of it this way, on a scale of one to 100, they need 51% that the allegation more than likely happened. They don't have to have beyond a reasonable doubt like local law enforcement. I just briefly want to touch on some frequently asked questions when it comes to some barriers when we think about calling the hotline, because if you haven't called the hotline, it can be a little scary, sometimes a little frustrating. Um, and you may wonder, am I really doing the right thing? But if you ever have a question or a, a gut instinct that something's going on, it's never wasted time. You always want to call. So the first question, if I call the hotline, will the family be told that I'm the reporter? By law, the child maltreatment law, they are not supposed to ever release who the reporter is. No one should release that. Not state police, crimes against children, and not DCFS. But as I um, tell adults, everyone makes assumptions, right? So they may assume that you're the one that made the report. So it's always important to follow your guidelines and policies and procedures wherever you work at to know how to handle that situation if a caretaker um, accuses you of making a report or questions you about it. But by law, they are not to release the reporter's information. Another one, if I know other professionals um, are involved with the family and may have already reported a situation, do I still need to call to make a report? Absolutely. If you have information um, or concerns of a child or children, you need to be the one that reports that. You don't want to um, put it off on someone else. Maybe you and one of your colleagues both have information, but maybe you observe something a little bit differently. So both of you get together and report it or report it separately. Like I said earlier, they can screen um, and merge the investigations together if there's already an open case with the family. Another one is, have I fulfilled my obligation as a mandated reporter if I tell my supervisor about my suspicions of child maltreatment? Absolutely not. The law states that you must call immediately. Of course, follow your procedures and policies um, that are in place with, within your organization, but you cannot put it off on your supervisor um, to decide if this should be reported. If you have the information, you want to be the one to report. If your um, policy is to notify your supervisor, hey, I just made a report, here's the referral number, or document that somewhere, absolutely do that. So what do child advocacy centers do? Um, here at the Cooper Anthony Mercy Child Advocacy Center, we've been here since 2003. Um, we, all, we opened our MENA location, it's a satellite office, in 2015, and we opened our Benton office in 2018. But we provide services to um, child abuse victims, and the abuse can be anything, and also witnesses of abuse um, and siblings. So sometimes it could be a homicide case and local law enforcement goes on scene and they call us and say, hey, there were three kids that may have witnessed this homicide. Can we bring them in? Absolutely. So every child is afforded a forensic interview with a highly skilled forensic interviewer. Everything is done in a forensic interview room that's audio and video recorded, just the child and the forensic interviewer. Um, everything is open-ended, legally defensible um, for court. 
We also provide forensic medical evaluations and exams. We have um, a couple or a few SANE nurses, the sexual assault nurse examiners on staff that can offer those services. And most importantly, we have our victim advocacy and support. Um, so our advocates meet the family right where they're at as soon as they walk in. Um, they're able to work with them throughout the investigation and beyond, regardless of the outcome. We are not the investigators here at the CAC, but we will work with the family until they're 18. The services are free. We have mental health services here. Um, mostly we offer trauma-focused cognitive behavioral counseling, TFCBT. We also offer EMDR, CPP, um, and this is very specialized training, as you all know. Um, we do prevention and community education. So uh, we go into schools and we teach a body safety program, one classroom at a time. And we empower the children to say no. Um, if they ever get a feeling that something's wrong, who are they gonna tell? We have them raise their hand and identify five safe adults. It's really, really empowering. Um, we also do community education. So we train adults on any topics that they want and all of our services here are free. There are actually 17 child advocacy centers in the state. So wherever you're joining from, there's likely an advocacy center nearby. Um, the goal of the advocacy centers and having um, 17 is that a family will not have to travel more than an hour for those free services. So definitely reach out. I encourage you to reach out to your local CAC um, and find out more about what they do and how to get involved um, and check them out. So here at the CAMCAC, we are always on call. We always have a forensic interviewer and an advocate on call for emergent needs. Um, we do serve six counties. We serve Garland, Saline, Polk, Montgomery, part of Hot Spring County and Grant County. And I already stated earlier, but we do have three offices. Taylor, are you there? Yes. Okay. I believe this is the blank screen. Is that what you're seeing on your side? Is this where you want to play the video? I believe so. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> I didn't realize that's where we were at. Hang tight, everybody. I'm going to play the video for us. The Child Advocacy Center provides a response to allegations of child abuse. It is a coordinated, comprehensive approach in the fight against child abuse. The Advocacy Center is there to provide that blueprint to that family and that child. So as this process is unfolding, they will have someone that is there for them in the best interest of the child and putting that child and that family first. When a child comes into the interview room, a lot of times they don't know why they're there and they've never been in a situation where they are the holder of the knowledge. So it's a very unique experience being in the room. The forensic interview is, is essential. Um, we're, we're talking about some of the most 
traumatic experiences being relived. And having a professional who is able to not only navigate that difficult situation, but also extract key and critical case information is invaluable. The job of an advocate is to meet the family right where they're at as soon as they walk through our doors. We're able to help the family with resources and provide support throughout the process of an investigation. When the caregiver first walks through our doors, they're oftentimes scared, nervous, and unsure of the process. We are able to walk them through the process and provide comfort and meet them right where they're at. When they leave here, they feel heard and understood and we're able to help them with resources throughout the investigative process. My experience with the CAC was absolutely incredible. Number one, I knew that when I was taken there that I was never going to go back to my abusive home situation. And so I remember going in and obviously like every other child, it's pretty scary. You know, not a lot of things are familiar. The people there obviously cared about me. All our services here at CAMCAC are free. And every year, the number of children that we serve increases. On average, it costs about $2,800 per child. So donations are paramount to us being able to provide services. Unfortunately, we are needed, but fortunately, we are here. CAMCAC's goal is to empower children to find their voice, to heal from previous abuse, and prevent further abuse. When we first walked into the door, it had been CAC. I was extremely overwhelmed and apprehensive and just not not excited to be there again or at any advocacy center or going through this process again but by the time that we left i had realized that this was completely different than every other time before we felt like something was going to happen this time so here at CAMCAC, we um, use evidence-based practices um, to approach the trauma. We have TFCBT trained therapists, um, child parent psychotherapy, and EMDR that we use with the kids that have experienced trauma. I can't even list uh, the wonderful things about having the CAC and how it affects a prosecutor uh, and how it helps a prosecutor in their case. I started uh, this profession back in 1997 before there were child advocacy centers and I cannot tell you how uh, the system and having a child advocacy center is so beneficial to not only the criminal case but to the well-being of the child during the proceedings and afterwards. Okay, I hope everyone was able to hear that. I'm sorry if you weren't. So I know um, here at our center, we do um, partner with local um, mental health service providers. So like we have MOU agreements in place where um, we can refer clients over that can get in a little bit quicker. So it's really um, important that you also reach out to your local advocacy center and see how you can um, partner with them. I want to briefly touch on our statistics. Just for 2021, we served a total of 726 children between all three of our locations. And there were over 30,000 reports accepted last year by the Child um, Abuse Hotline. And not every child that is um, reported is referred to a child advocacy center, unfortunately. But the numbers are um, very impactful here. You see that we serve 376 here at our Hot Springs office, um, 275 in Benton, 74 at our MENA office for a total of 726 children. And the allegation um, referral types, most of them were sexual abuse. Um, some were physical abuse or neglect or witnessing violence, whether it's domestic violence, um, homicides, anything. 
So the way that advocacy centers get referrals is through an investigation. So there has to be an investigation, either through the Arkansas State Police Crimes Against Children, um, DCFS, local law enforcement, or prosecution um, will oftentimes call us for, um, you know, needing a child to be seen and interviewed and, and uh, to get into counseling here. Sometimes we get calls from parents, um, different people in the community, and they want their child to come in because they, they think something may be going on. Um, usually our advocates will just work with the family um, and refer them out to other services but there has to be some form of investigation or report for a child to come here. So just some prevention tips. There are so many, but really, um, as you all being professionals, building relationships with the clients that you're working with, really getting to know um, their family and having that rapport, um, helping them to build relationships with each other, strengthening their relationships, um, sending them, referring them to support groups, modeling good practices. Um, you know, do while you're in session, is your session um, able to be observed? Do you have a window um, on your door where someone could um, see what's going on or interrupt if needed? That um, do you have a code of conduct that you're not going to be alone in the building with a child, especially a child that has. Um, experience trauma. It's really important that you continue trainings like this, recognizing the signs and symptoms of child maltreatment or abuse, um, understanding disclo the disclosure process. Oftentimes we want children to tell us or we think that a child will tell us every single detail, what it looked like, smelled like, tastes like, but they oftentimes they won't. And why is that? They're scared, they're embarrassed, they're ashamed, they don't want to relive what's happened to them. Um, oftentimes, more than 90% of the time, the alleged offender, the abuser, is someone known to the child, someone they love, someone they trust. So always bear in mind why they may withhold some information. So I just really encourage you anytime you have a child that and it's exhibiting any types of red flags, you know, report it. They may be giving you just a little breadcrumb of what's going on. And oftentimes when a child is referred to a child advocacy center for that forensic interview, our forensic interviewers will screen for every form of maltreatment. So that child is able to talk about anything and everything that's ever happened. There's no time frame. Um, Teach that abuse is preventable. Refer families to us, have them call us, um, come by for a tour, come by um, and see how you can get involved. Refer um, your families, the parents for um, to the Child Advocacy Center to get more tips on one thing that we do here. We talk about tips for summer camps when parents are getting ready to send their children to camps some questions and some pointers to ask those camps to see what types of practices they have in place. Have they been trained in child maltreatment and mandated reporter training so they know what to do and how to handle disclosures? Um, disclosure happens in different ways. It is a true process. Um, it, it could be behaviorally, it could be directly, um, it could be, you know, writing a letter non-verbally, um, going on social media and out crying there. Um, and just know it is a process, especially if a child has endured years and years and years of trauma. They're not going to remember every single thing on the um, you know, first time that they talk about it. There are several websites. I just listed a few here just so you all can explore um, additional resources and check out what's going on. I love the National Children's Advocacy Center. They have tons of publications. Um, the Morgan Mick Foundation, Darkness to Light is amazing. It um, specializes in the prevention of child sexual abuse. And I know across the state that the child advocacy centers, 
most of the advocacy centers have a darkness to light stewards of children facilitator that could offer those trainings to you for free. Um, I know we do here, we have two facilitators here on staff, um, myself and my um, colleague, Stacey Bonds. So reach out um, if you want even more information or you said, well, can you send us something specifically on a certain topic? Reach out to me. If I don't have the information, I can refer you to your local CAC, depending on where you're at. I'd be glad to help you. Um, do we have any questions, Anna Kate? Uh, yeah, a few questions came in. Let me pull those up. Um, let's see. So someone wants to know um, what's permitted to ask in order to obtain information for the investigator. Um, sometimes I feel confused that many children don't disclose when they confidently disclose in session. I'm also curious about the process when the children come in for the interview. Several of my clients have returned to me saying they did not feel comfortable to disclose. I was unsure why, just wanting to know what I can maybe prepare them for as far as the procedure goes. Sure, great questions. So it's really hard to say, you know, there are certain things that you have to have in order to call the hotline. You're going to have to have the victim's name, locating information, and some form of maltreatment, whether you've observed it or they told you specifically that something's going on. Always use the child's language or verbiage, whatever they said. Don't put your spin on it. So what I like to say and, and tell you is just keep it open-ended. You know, I hear you, Sally. I, I, um, I see that you have a burn on your arm. Tell me about that. Well, and they go on and tell you. That's enough to report. You don't have to have like how many times it happened or who all was around, but you do have to have some information in order to report it. Um, now, on the other end, you, your question about how to prepare them for a forensic interview. If you know that a report's been accepted, maybe they say, hey, tomorrow we have to go to the advocacy center. Do you know anything about it? Who are these people? We've never met them. So really, um, it is a safe, neutral, child-friendly environment. But I will tell you, the forensic interviewers are not able to ask like the specific direct questions. They have to remain very neutral. They go in oftentimes blind about you know whatever the allegation type is they're going to go in neutral and they're going to explore everything every form of maltreatment so it's not like going in for a counseling session and really having that um, connection and ongoing rapport oftentimes they meet with the forensic interviewer just one time but i i would say it would be important to encourage your clients to just be honest this is the time there's no time frame on how long they will have to be in the interview room it's really child focused and child led if a child comes in and they say well you know what i'm not ready to talk about this um i don't feel comfortable we never force a child to talk about it about anything they do not have to stay in the interview room but we will make that attempt um, once a child is referred to us I hope that answered um, your questions. If not, send um, some more details. Yeah, um, there was also a question about um, do you, if you have any suggestions on what to do when the hotline operator does not send a correct narrative to the investigator, and what should we do when um, we do not hear from the investigators? Who should we address at that point? Yeah, so while you're on the phone with the hotline operator they're going to be asking you questions and while you all are having that conversation they're typing they may paraphrase what you say so there's really no way to know for sure what they're reporting uh, or what they're keying in their narrative but in the policies the investigator whoever's assigned whether it's dcfs or state police they are to notify the reporter if the reporter left 
their information and ask any additional follow-ups. So if I was the investigator, I would call you and say, hey, I got your report. Thank you for making this call. Do you have anything else um, that you want to share that would be beneficial to my investigation? And you may say, yeah, I actually thought about it after I hung up the phone and share this, uh, whatever um, additional information you have. They are supposed to call the reporter in every single investigation. So if you haven't, if you're having some issues or haven't been notified, the best thing to do is just call the hotline back and um, you could ask to speak to a supervisor. There are um, quite a few supervisors there that you could ask, hey, I made a report. Can you tell me, you know, they said it was accepted, but no one's called me. Maybe that supervisor can contact the investigative agency or the investigator supervisor and say, hey, reporter just called. Uh, but they're not going to like give you the reporter or the investigator's cell phone or contact information, but they could push your information out. That would be my best recommendation. And always when you call the hotline, it's all audio recorded. Um, so a supervisor could always re-listen to a conversation that had been previously reported. Okay, thank you. Um, one last question. Oh, actually, there's a few more coming in here. Okay. Um, the same person who had the question about uh, that you were just addressing about not hearing back. Um, she's uh, stated that she doesn't get notified very often about one out of every 10 calls and she hasn't had good luck calling the hotline back. So would it make sense to contact the ombudsman on this matter? I think so. I think that would be fine. Um, and see where where that gets you and if that doesn't help um, depending on which agency it is go to their website if it's dcfs and go to um, the area supervisor all of that contact information will be online if it is arkansas state police crimes against children go to that website and see which area what county you're calling from and call that supervisor um, and just have that ongoing dialogue with them and state your concerns. Hey, I'm calling and maybe one of every 10 calls, someone's calling me back. And that supervisor can pull up the, the documentation in the investigation in the system and see what the investigator documented. Because there's a port, uh, there is a spot in there that they have to report their contact with the reporter. So if that's blank, then the supervisor would be like, okay, they haven't contacted you yet, you know, I will call, talk to them about that. Great. Uh, they found that information really helpful. So just to let you know. <laughs> um, one other question. Um, someone was wondering how CAMCAC, where you're located, is related to the chapter that Elizabeth Pulley is the executive director for. Could you explain what the chapter does versus what the CACs do? Yes, Elizabeth Pulley, she's wonderful. So she is the chapter executive director for all of the CACs in the state. So when you think of um, statewide processes or programs and kind of being that go to liaison um, legislation, when you think of legislation being in session, having a lobbyist, having folks that are right there, um, her team will work with all of the CACs will work on the multidisciplinary team um, to better the processes. They'll have retreats for the advocates, have retreats for the forensic interviewers, um, anything that they can provide and help with. Some of the funding for CACs um, funnels and is channeled through the state chapter. So most states will have a state chapter that is the chapter of every CAC um, in the state. It's just the go-to um, person. Of course, every CAC also has their director. They know their service area, you know, the directors do and can um, be a little more detailed, but the state chapter is very, very, very beneficial, whether it's funding or training, um, anything like that. I hope that answered your question. Yes, that was great. Thank you. Uh -huh. Well, um, this has been a really wonderful presentation, perfect for Child Abuse Prevention Month. Um, I am going to flip to the next slide here. 
And um, that is our webinar code. So for those of you who are wanting to get a CEU for attending this webinar, I will be sending out an email to everybody who attended this webinar. And in that email, there will be a link to a survey. Uh, click on that link and fill out that survey. You can put in your name and this code and you will receive a CEU certificate by email uh, shortly after. So that should um, take care of that. And um, I just wanted to thank Taylor one more time for this wonderful presentation and thank all of you for attending today. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and a wonderful weekend. Thank you.